when this church right here, the Mount Zion Baptist Church, the pastor, the Reverend T.J. Jemison, he says he stood every day and he would watch the buses pass. And that was in 53. And when the, as the buses passed, all the black passengers were standing. One or two white passengers was on the bus. They would go and sit at the, the very back of the bus. When they sit at the back, no black passenger could sit in front of them. If a white person got on the bus, they had to sit from the front loaded to the back. When blacks got on the bus, they sat from the back to the front. And there was a sign that moved along with the whites. And as the bus began to fill with white people, uh, the sign would go further and further to the back. Now, if a white person got on the bus, blacks could not sit in front of them. So if there were all these empty seats that were between a white and a black, if that white person was sitting there and all of the black section was filled up, black still could not go to the front to sit. So there was a, a lady and two others. They decided that they were not going to stand in alone. <clears throat> they were going to sit. So they took seat immediately behind the drive of the bus. The bus got, driver got up and told them to move in uncertain terms, and raving at them. And so they had made a promise that they wasn't going, they wasn't going to move. You know, they were going to sit and care what, what they say. The Baton Rouge Bus Workout begins with T.J. Jemison. He decided to petition the city of Baton Rouge for a city ordinance that would allow blacks to sit in previous, previously designated areas uh, for white patrons. He went to the city leaders of Baton Rouge and asked for this city ordinance, and he was granted one. And the ordinance is 222. The ordinance basically said that if a uh, bus was in a black neighborhood and black white patrons were not on the bus, black patrons had the right to sit in previously designated seats, only while they were in the black neighborhoods, though. So those maids that he saw standing over those empty seats could now sit as long as there was not a white person on the bus. But, but my son Johnny, Johnny Jr., when we would be in our car and the bus would pass us, oh, he, he, would, he would just have a 51 one ride. Ooh, daddy, daddy, daddy. I want to see that bus, he just, just, just carried on, so I didn't know what to do because he carried on, so I didn't want to expose him to that. So, so I see. <clears throat> so one day I just decided that I was going to drive up in front of one of those buses and catch it. When I got on the bus, I had to pay for myself, and he just ran and jumped in the first seat immediately behind the bus driver. And the bus driver wouldn't wait, wouldn't, wouldn't do that. He just jumped up, you can't sit there. Put him, told him he had to go to the back. And Ray, that a little child, I don't know, more than four or five years old, left that old, and just carried on. He carried on so I didn't know what to do. And so I told him, I said, I told him, I said, son, just go on back to the back. We got to go to the back. I said, but one day, Daddy going to take care of this for you. And that's, that's, that's what happened. Uh, the story goes, as I'm told by Reverend Jennison and some of the uh, patrons who actually participated, it goes with uh, the citizens being fed up with uh, having to pay for the right to sit on the bus and still could not sit. And after the city ordinance uh, 222 was granted and blacks began to use that ordinance, white bus drivers did not want blacks to sit directly behind them, so they went on strike. And when they went on strike, they struck for about three days. And when they returned to work, blacks had organized as an organization, and they decided to go on strike as well. They boycotted the bus company. 
for seven days and costing the bus company roughly about $1,500 per day. Now, when they were on strike, uh, bo uh, boycotting, the black citizens got together every afternoon. They met at a different church in the community. They raised money to uh, come up with ways to make sure that blacks could continue to get to work without using the bus system. And that's how you get the free ride system. What they were trying to do was show the city of Baton Rouge that they, the treatment that they had imposed upon the black citizens here was unfair. And they didn't realize that there would be such an economic impact. That $1,500 virtually uh, could have bankrupt the bus company if the, uh, if the boycott had continued much longer. So it was very significant. Uh, they hit the bus company in its pockets. And it was, it was funny because when you got an opportunity to speak to some of the patrons who actually participated, when those bus drivers realized that their uh, livelihood was being financed by black patrons, then they had to rethink that whole situation. Would they drive those buses with the uh, city ordinance 222 being held over their heads? Many of them said yes, because that was the only way that they could make a decent living here in Baton Rouge. It changed a lot because I became assistant parish attorney in 68 until 72. And then in 72, I went to the legislature. And before then, they didn't have any, anybody black had any kind of, any kind of title connected with government. I, I, I think if I had had, had nine months school like everybody else, I probably would have been the first to go to the White House. <laughs> Baton Rouge's impact on the rest of the civil rights movement is because of the blueprint that we were able to establish here. This blueprint is going to circulate at one of the SCLC meetings. We know that Reverend Jemison actually visits Baton Rouge and meets with uh, T.J. Jemison and some of the other participants here. here. We know that he actually takes that uh, blueprint to the SCLC meeting that was being held in Alabama at that time. And all of the ministers, Ralph Abernathy, Martin Luther King, Fred Shuttleworth, all of them are at this meeting. So they now have a blueprint that they can go back to their respective communities and actually desegregate legally. Uh, so Baton Rouge is gonna become that, uh, that place that where the civil rights movement actually begins. Unfortunately, very few people just know about us.